The issues of sustainability, conservation and mitigating climate change play a massive role in our societies today as we see firsthand how the human population is growing, species extinction rates have never been higher and we are starting to see more extreme weather conditions associated with climate change. It seems like it's becoming increasingly difficult to generate enough food and resources for our growing human population without destroying everything around us in the process. However, there are solutions to all of these problems. We can sustainably manage resources, move towards more sustainable forms of agriculture, and we can put strategies in place to help people and wildlife cope with our changing environment. The issues are that we need to act quickly and we need to ensure that what we do is effective. Collectively, that means that now, more than ever, biodiversity monitoring is one of the most crucial parts of conservation for identifying specific conservation needs in a given area, ensuring that resource use is sustainable and testing new methods to help cope with climate change. Operation Wallacea, or OPWAL for short, is a UK-based organisation with offices across the globe. We specialise in large-scale biodiversity monitoring projects to generate the data used to devise solutions to major conservation issues. The Opwall Biodiversity Research Team now comprise more than 200 academics and 90 PhD students who are working in a series of remote sites around the world from June to August each year. Now that sounds like a big team, but divided across all the different locations, it's nowhere near enough manpower to collect enough data and collect it quickly enough to actually make a difference. We therefore open up the expeditions to students to work alongside us to collect the data, which massively increases our manpower. The programmes are funded by tuition fees paid by students, who then get the chance to work in the field with these international teams of scientists and learn from them, while at the same time supporting the creation of these long-term data sets. We then analyse the data and liaise with local governments, communities and other NGOs to use the results of our studies to create new conservation strategies for the areas where we work. In addition, over 500 publications in peer-reviewed journals have been produced from our work. Deforestation is the single biggest driver of species extinctions. So by reforesting or preventing forests from being clear felled, the benefits are not just to the climate, but also to biodiversity. One way to tackle this issue is via carbon credits, where countries and multinational companies invest in protecting forest or reforesting programs to offset their own carbon footprint. Many of our tropical forest expeditions focus on collecting all the necessary biodiversity and carbon data so that they can be packaged for investment in carbon credits to generate income for reserve management teams and local communities in exchange for their continued protection of the forest. Lowland forests of Sulawesi and Borneo in Indonesia the Fiji forests on the islands of Vanua Level and cloud forests in Honduras are examples of projects you can join that are helping with reducing deforestation or encouraging reforestation. In Guyana, we are using a different approach by calculating sustainable logging quotas for local people. So it's less than 1% of the trees are taken in each block on a 60 year rotation. And this is a means of providing income for communities and protecting biodiversity by avoiding clear felling of the forests. Coral reefs and marine ecosystems have really taken a big hit in recent years, with the combined problems of coral bleaching caused by rising sea temperatures and serious issues with overfishing. As corals die out, we lose structural complexity on the reefs. We lose food for a wide range of fish, as well as direct biodiversity loss from the corals. 
The decline in food and structural complexity means that less fish are attracted to the reefs, resulting in serious drops in food supply for large marine life and also human populations. Moreover, less fish grazing on the algae that collects on the reefs means that the corals decline even further. Operation Wallacea have marine research teams in the most diverse reef systems in the world at our sites in Silhouette and Borneo, in the Indian Ocean at our site in Madagascar and in the Caribbean reefs of Honduras, Mexico and Dominica. These teams have created an integrated method for reef monitoring that uses technology to generate extremely accurate assessments of 3D reef structure to assess coral abundance, diversity and health, to monitor abundance of macroinvertebrates such as sea urchins that are really important algal grazers, and to monitor fish abundance and population structure. Our teams then investigate the relationships between all these elements to determine sustainable fishing quotas based on the current states of the reefs. We figure out opportunities to increase structural complexity on the reefs and therefore boost fish populations using artificial reefs and we also assess the suitability for reef restoration work. Similar methods are being used at our marine site in Croatia to assess the benefits of sea grasses to fish communities and to help manage fisheries sustainably. One of the major issues associated with climate change is more frequent extreme weather conditions such as hurricanes or extreme flooding and drought. The island of Dominica was severely hit by hurricane in 2017 and as so much forest was destroyed it was presumed that the already endangered endemic imperial Amazon parrot was severely impacted or extinct. Thanks to the Upborn Monitoring Project in Dominica, we were able to rapidly assess the situation and did find a surviving population, but in dramatically reduced numbers. We urgently sent the data to IUCN so the conservation status of the species could be changed to critically endangered, which then liberates funding from IUCN for species conservation programme. In Calakmul, Mexico, prolonged drought resulted in the disappearance of water bodies in the reserve, uh, known locally as aguadas. When rains returned, the government assumed all was well, but our monitoring data showed that the aguadas now had so much secondary vegetation in them that they didn't fill up with water despite the rains, uh, resulting in a massive decline in fauna and huge problems uh, for local people. Our data procured $30,000 of emergency funding from UNESCO to try and implement new methods for aguada restoration. All manipulated aguadas filled to the top following rains, providing water for both local people and fauna. So now we know exactly what to do when faced with the next prolonged drought. The Peruvian Amazon has experienced similar extreme weather fluctuations with a mixture of flooding and drought. Extreme flooding results in habitat loss for many terrestrial species, whereas drought and low water levels in the river system forces aquatic species into the main rivers, making it very easy to overfish. Our project has monitored the impact of these changing conditions on fauna to create new sustainable hunting and fishing quotas for the Kokama Indian communities that can be easily adapted based on the abundance of terrestrial and aquatic species. These quotas therefore ensure long-term food security for the Indian communities as well as well, wildlife conservation. Many other conservation issues are associated with growing human populations, resulting in habitat loss to make way for urbanisation or for agriculture. In Malawi, our research teams are investigating the impact of urbanisation on a variety of wildlife living outside of protected areas, combined with developing methods to minimise human-wildlife conflict. In Madagascar, huge amounts of the dry forests on the island have been completely felled to make way for fields for rice. Complete deforestation obviously has a devastating impact on wildlife, such as the endemic lemurs. But the rice fields really don't generate much income for these communities either. 
If more sustainable forms of agriculture can be combined with income from ecotourism, then the outcome will be better for both human and wildlife populations. The Operation Wanasea project is focused on generating data to demonstrate the effectiveness of community management of dry forests as a way of sustainably increasing the area of forests under protection in this very poor country where the cost of establishing a large network for national parks just isn't feasible. However, not all agriculture is bad, and if managed properly, it can actually benefit biodiversity. At our field site in Transylvania, traditional farming methods that carefully manage meadows and maintain a complex forest farm matrix have produced some of the most biodiverse landscapes in Europe. Now this area in the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains is under threat from intensification of agriculture. Our research project has highlighted the importance of these traditional farming methods for maintaining biodiversity so that we can help traditional farmers receive financial assistance, enabling them to continue with these sustainable practices. Growing human populations also leads to increasing tourism. Now, tourism can actually be a solution to many conservation issues if managed properly. But without correct management plans in place, tourism can have a serious negative impact on the environment. South Africa has pioneered a very successful approach to wildlife conservation by fencing grassland and bush reserves and growing international tourism to visit and experience the large mammal and bird fauna from safaris. However, when large game animals are fenced into an area, very careful management plans are required to prevent overgrazing or overbrazing of vegetation that can lead to ecosystem collapse. So our research projects in South Africa focus on providing biodiversity data to help improve these management plans. In Croatia, our project is focused in the spectacular Kirkon National Park that has started to become very popular with tourism. Now currently almost all tourism is concentrated on one area of the reserve where it's starting to have a negative impact on wildlife. Our research project is generating the biodiversity monitoring data to identify new areas of the reserve that could be suitable for sustainable tourism and also to assist with calculations for sustainable tourism carrying capacity. Operation Wallacea have also provided data on the impact of tourism on green sea turtles living in the seagrasses in Mexico. Our data indicated that unmanaged snorkel tours with turtles were destroying the seagrass habitat and subjecting the turtles to extremely high levels of chronic stress that was impacting on their health. The Mexican government used our data to help create a new marine protected area and create a sustainable management plan for the new MPA. We are now monitoring the success of this new plan in maintaining a healthy turtle population and seagrass habitat. Joining an Otwell expedition is not only a life-changing experience, but will provide you with invaluable skill set that you can take home forever. From learning conservation strategies and how to fundraise, uh, to using survey methods in the field and working with local communities. This real-world experience is especially important if you're interested in a career in conservation biology or anything that involves a field-based component. A large number of volunteers who have come away with us on expedition have gone on to work with us or other NGOs as field staff, have continued on to PhD level or pursue careers in relevant fields of work. So joining an Opwell expedition really can provide the first step on this ladder. There is now an international network of ex Opwell volunteers throughout the world working on wildlife conservation related issues. So we hope you can soon become one of those people. Most people join the program as a research assistant, where you work with all the scientists on site and can maximise your experience. Following your training in data collection methods, combined with academic lectures on the ecology and conservation issues of your research location, you can then work directly alongside the academic teams to assist with data collection. 
Each site operates with a whiteboard system where the scientists all record the, the evening before what time they're going to be getting up and leaving camp and what research they'll be doing the next day. So you can then sign up for whichever project you want to do uh, the following day and most people rotate between various different options before then deciding to concentrate with one or two scientists to get a bit more in-depth experience. The second way of joining the programme is as a dissertation or thesis student to complete your own independent research project as part of your undergraduate or master's level degree. When you arrive on site, you will complete the same training and lecture series as the research assistants, but then you'll spend the rest of your time focusing on data collection for your project with the support from our academic teams. Your priority for your time on site is to make sure you collect enough data to get a first class independent research project. Indeed, over 92% of students doing research projects with us get the top two grades for their uh, finished thesis projects. And Opwell dissertation students have won the best undergraduate level of project at a range of universities. Joining as a dissertation student is therefore an excellent option if you already have a keen interest in a specific species, taxa or conservation topic and wish to pursue this for your career. So does an Opwell expedition sound like the opportunity of a lifetime you just can't miss, but the one thing holding you back is the expense? Well, don't panic. There is a team of professional fundraisers at Opwell who are here to help. Over the 25 years of running expeditions, the fundraising teams have helped tens of thousands of students from all over the world raise the money they need to be able to join an Opwell expedition. Over 80% of students that decide to fundraise reach their fundraising target or go on to raise a full expedition cost. Fundraising is an integral part of any expedition and in many ways it will be the most difficult challenge but also one of the most rewarding. Once you have secured an expedition place, you will receive access to our full fundraising information where we cover everything from settling on a realistic target and creating a fundraising plan to how you can write grant application letters and successfully organise events for maximum profit. We have information on hundreds of grants worldwide, including university-specific grants and several grants exclusively set up by Opwell. The fundraising team will also help to set up an effective fundraising group at your university so you can maximise your fundraising potential with both individual and group efforts and also share ideas and become a support network for one another. I have been on three expeditions with Operation Wallacea, two of which were for my dissertation for university, Mexico and South Africa and one I was a research assistant in Guyana. To get there I did different fundraising events one of which was an advent run. I ran every day of advent. On the 1st of December I ran a kilometre and I added a kilometre each day until Christmas Day on the 25th. So running for 25 days, it came out to 200 miles in total, which is actually the equivalent of seven marathons. I mean, I really wasn't a runner. I hadn't run all the way through, all through university, all through the end of school. So I was so unfit. It was a challenge. Um, but it was amazing and I actually I got over a thousand pounds just for doing that. I would definitely look at running online events, so you know pub quizzes, online quizzes, you know wine tasting evenings. I've been on a couple and they're actually really good fun and you know cooking, learn a new skill and then provide a class for it for your friends, family. You can definitely be imaginative so I would definitely just think outside the box when coming up with uh, an event. I went on an Operation Wallacea expedition to Hoga Island in 2017. I did various fundraising activities for the expedition ranging from small scale events to larger scale ones. Uh, the largest one being a quiz night for family and friends. Um, and I managed to raise just over £1,700 um, through this event and that was just by spreading the word out as much as I could um, and ending up with 100 people attending where I charged £6 for a ticket and that included entry and also a buffet was provided too. Um, there was a raffle, there was um, a silent auction and there was also smaller things around the hall like a bucket on the bar um, just for any extra change people wanted to donate as well. 
Remember, this has been achieved by countless other volunteers and with a little bit of hard work, determination and a helping hand from us, you can totally do this. So what exactly should you do now if you think you might be interested in joining an Operation Wallaceer expedition? Well, the first step is to read through our online brochure and take a good look at our website where you'll find information about the specific expedition destinations and projects. The next step is to join our online project selection meeting. This meeting is extremely helpful in deciding if this is the right thing for you. We will chat to you about your areas of interest and help you figure out the perfect expedition for you in terms of location, dates and activities. After finding your perfect expedition, the next phase will be to attend one of our online fundraising meetings, where the team will use the information gained from your project selection meeting to help you start your fundraising straight away, including figuring out specific information about the grants that you can apply for. Now, in order to attend this fundraising meeting and get access to our brilliant fundraising resources, you will need to have reserved a place on the expedition uh, because at this stage, our information is for students who are ready to commit. But don't panic. In the meantime, there is a whole Opwall team happy to chat over the phone, email or web chat in order to answer any questions you may have about the expeditions or fundraising. When you decide that you would like to join one of the expeditions, you can reserve a place by completing the online registration form or by contacting us directly so we can talk you through the steps for booking a place. Now, one question you might be asking is, what about COVID-19? How does this affect everything? Well, the economic impact of COVID-19 on our partners in developing countries has been devastating. Now, generally with no government help and no annual income from our research teams either. We need to get back to these remote locations as soon as possible and you can be guaranteed an amazing welcome if you're part of the returning 2021 research teams. Now at the time of recording this film, most countries are beginning to develop travel bubbles to other countries that they regard as safe and then imposing travel restrictions on the other countries. The list of countries deemed safe is constantly changing, so it is difficult to know where you can go. The main issue to note is how rapidly travel advice is changing, and almost certainly by early 2021, the situation would have changed beyond recognition as one or more of the dozens of potential vaccines become available. For most people, joining a project like this requires some fundraising and saving, which means you need to make a decision well before we will know exactly which countries it will be possible to visit. When you reserve a place on the expedition, you pay a 10% deposit. This deposit is refundable, apart from a £50 or $95 admin fee, until we know for sure that the country you've selected for your expedition is going to be open for international visitors without quarantining on the way in or on the way going back to your home country. That means that you can sign up with plenty of time to fundraise and if the country doesn't open up by say February 2020, you can get all the money back you've paid apart from the admin fee or you can swap for a project in a country that is open. So no need to gamble with your money. You can sign up for your preferred project now. It's safe in the knowledge that your funds are safe.